have mounted for this sort of behavior um, in animals. So for example, calling out after the loss of a mate, or searching, or weeping, or antisocial behavior and becoming quite isolated, uh, which is a sign of depression. So it's very universal. <laughs> so that really raises the question of, if grief is so universal, why do we experience it? And so evolution, just to remind you, the theories that are involved in evolution um, are relevant to the question of grief because they make us think about whether grief is adaptive or maladaptive. And if it is maladaptive, how it was selected for through natural selection. So a really good way to understand the theory of evolution uh, to think about the black pepper moth, which you may or may not be able to notice on this tree bark because of its appearance. So it blends quite nicely into the tree bark. <laughs> um, and so the theory of the evolution is that when there's a challenge in the environment, a species will adapt to be able to survive. And some of the features um, that are present in the species that allow it to thrive in the environment are described as a competitive advantage. And so a black peppered moth that has an appearance that allows it to blend into the bark of the tree is going to give it a competitive advantage. And that competitive advantage is going to increase its fitness. So the thing about grief is actually there's a lot of research that shows that grief can actually reduce a person's health in many ways. So for example, it can lead to changes in the immune system which means that a person is maybe more susceptible to infection, which I'll talk about in a bit. And it can also mean that the reproductive capacity can be reduced. So there are lots of reasons to think that grief isn't very beneficial. It's actually the opposite. Yet it's something that is universal, so it must be important. And a way to understand that is through this quote. So the bonds which joy alone forms with an object would in its absence be quickly dissolved were there no sorrow to reinforce it. And that quote was really talking about the emotions that we have in relation to separation. So social bonds are really important because they help us to survive. We need each other and that's very evident. And in order to maintain those social bonds, we're not constantly attached at the hip. We have loved ones who come in and out of our lives. And so it's really important that we develop mechanisms that allow us to maintain those social bonds, even when the person isn't present. So for humans, we actually exhibit a lot of distress when we're separated from our loved ones. And this is also common in animals. And the reason why we have these reactions is because it reinforces those bonds and helps us to reunify when we're separate. So you can really think about the example of a crying baby. So a baby's crying, it will call out to its mother and then the mother will return and that causes this reunification. So that distress that we feel during separation is actually really important. And that's something, that's a feature that is adaptive. So you can see why that is really helpful for us. And grief actually is kind of a byproduct of that. So when you think of adaptive features, you need to think of the whole picture. So fighting is another example. So a lot of animals will fight, which uses up a lot of energy, and it also is actually quite risky, but it means that they can try and compete for resources, and it also means that um, they're able to protect themselves. So there's this kind of trade-off, and that's the same with our social bonds. We need to connect with each other to survive, and those connections are important to us, but at the same time, when there's connections are lost, and in the case of losing a loved one, when that separation becomes irreversible, then our brains find it quite difficult to understand initially that even though we're yearning for the person that we love, that we're not going to be reunified with them because these mechanisms aren't very flexible for when we're in the situation where we lost a loved one. So this is something that happens and something that our brain is actually quite capable and has developed to cope with. So I'm now going to move on to talking about how our brains regulate grief. And as I say, 
research into the neurobiology of grief is in its infancy. Um, but there is actually quite a lot of promising research, and I think the field is really expanding. But this is a paper from 2009, so about 10 years ago, which was published um, from Columbia University by the, a psychiatrist called Dr. Peter Freed. And it was all about trying to work out the mechanisms of grief regulation. So to understand how the brain works, there are different ways that we can study it. So we can directly measure brain activity, but that doesn't really tell us about what the different parts of the brain are doing. So different parts of the brain are responsible for different functions. So right now, as I'm talking to you, uh, my language centers are probably very active, and hopefully as you're listening, your auditory cortex in your brain is quite active. And a really smart way of looking at that is through functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, just to make it simpler. And this is a really good method which measures blood flow in the brain as a way to understand how much energy the brain is using. So if there's parts of the brain where there's a lot of blood flow, it means that lots of oxygen is being delivered. And oxygen is needed to convert glucose into energy because that's the fuel that the brain needs. So by measuring blood flow, we can understand which parts of the brain are functioning while someone is carrying out tasks. So they can be in a functional magnetic resonance imaging scanner. You might have had an MRI, it's kind of similar. And the person can carry out a task, and then you can actually visualize brain activity by looking at a signal, which basically looks like the brain lighting up. So you might have red where it's active and blue it's deactivated. And that really gives us an insight into how the brain is responding to different things. So this paper was really all about trying to understand how some people are able to tolerate reminders of their loved one that they've lost without having grief emotions. So I'm going to talk a little bit later about the different trajectories of grief. But in the acute period of grief, it's really difficult to have reminders of the person that you love that you've lost without having intrusive thoughts. So intrusive thoughts are just thoughts of the loved one popping into your head. And that can be because you've smelled a perfume that they used to wear, or something specific has reminded you of them, or it could have no explanation at all. This person could just pop into your head. And that tends to lead to grief emotions. So they wanted to find out what's happening in the brain and what are the differences between individuals. So they carried out this study on 20 individuals. And they used grief uh, in relation to the loss of a pet for this. And they did this deliberately because grief towards a pet, so pet bereavement, actually tends to be a bit purer because it's not as loaded. So if you have a group, a group of 20 different people, it's, you can't compare grief. But when you're grieving the loss of a pet, that's something that's a little bit more um, easier to study. So they use that as a model for grief. And so some of the ideas that they had was that reminders of the lost, uh, the person that they've lost, leads to intrusive thoughts, which increases grief emotions. And they're interested in a part of the brain called the amygdala. So you may have heard of the amygdala before. It's to do with the fear response. And so they thought that if you have high activity in the amygdala, you're going to have high grief emotions, and that's related to intrusive thoughts. So maybe the amygdala is actually playing a role in those intrusive thoughts and those emotions. But what they were really interested in was trying to work out which other parts of the brain are regulating the amygdala, and if there are any differences there. So I just want to draw your attention to these three different regions of the brain. So the amygdala on the left, these are two almond-shaped structures on each side of the brain. And that, as I say, is involved in the fear response. It's involved in distress reactions to separation. And um, it's also, it has been shown before to be involved in intrusive thoughts. And then you've got two other areas of the brain. You've got 
the prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate um, cortex. And these are in the parts of the brain which are to do with higher functioning. So sort of salience processing, working out things that are important and things that aren't when you're in your own sort of walking around your daily life, trying to figure out what kind of stimulus is relevant and what isn't. Um, and so the prefrontal cortex is in your, you have four different lobes in your brain. And so the frontal cortex is actually what sets us apart from other animals because it's the most developed in humans and it allows us to have these kind of complex cognitive functions. And the anterior cingulate cortex is, it's kind of like a collar around a bundle of fibres that hold the two hemispheres together and it's what it's a part of the brain that's involved in pain. So it's implicated in not just physical pain, but emotional pain as well. So those two first regions were areas they, they decided would be interesting to look at because of the way that in which they would maybe be regulating the amygdala. So this is an emotional street test. So when the people in the study were in the functional magnetic resonance imaging scanner, they had to carry out an emotional street test. And in this test, they were presented with a stack of 20 words which were related to the, the pet that they had lost. But these weren't emotionally loaded, things like leash and dog or bark. And then they had um, another stack of words which were more related to things just to do with the house, so they're neutral words. And this test is important because it allows scientists to be able to work out if someone has an attentional bias. So if someone has an attentional bias to something, it means that they would spend more time than someone else on kind of on that thing that they are, and it would be distracting to them. So they wanted to find out within this group of individuals, are they distracted by these words? So these words are given different colours, and the task was to name the colour, so red, blue, and green. And if there was any difference in reaction time or the that number of mistakes that were made, then they could conclude that there was a difference in intentional bias. So if I didn't have an intentional bias, I could look at both sets of words and say red, blue, green, red, blue, green. But if I did have an intentional bias to the words relating to the dog that I lost, I might make a mistake and say dog, green, I mean red, green, blue. And then when I look at the words relating to the house, I would have no trouble naming the colours. So when they did this, while the people were in the um, imaging scanner, they were able to look at different parts of the brain that lit up. And what they found was there are certain areas of brain, um, uh, this is normalised, so there's always brain activity, but they were able to find that people who did have an attentional bias, so the people that were taking longer to um, respond to those colours, actually had activity in these areas of the brain. So just to orientate you, so in the white, that's the white matter that's uh, to do with the connections between uh, different neurons, um, and then the brain matter, which is the cell bodies. And what you're looking at is activation in different brain areas, which is depicted here in orangey red. So the amygdala is activated, but then there's other regions to do with higher functions, like the insula, which is to do with trying to work out what's important and what's not, was also activated, and also temporal regions, which, were respons which are responsible for kind of how we represent ourselves and others. So they were all activated, so they knew these areas were important. So then they were really interested in Bruce's um, coping styles. So this isn't to say that one coping style is right and another one is wrong, but there are two different ones that they were able to focus on, which was um, an intrusiveness kind of grief response and avoidance. So some people will have an intrusive thought and then they'll ruminate over that. They find it really difficult to not think about uh, the thing that has come into their head. But with an avoidant grief style, you might have a reminder of the person that you love that you've lost, but you're able to carry on with whatever it was that you were doing before. So there are two different grief styles, and they wanted to understand what are the differences in the brain, how the brain really regulates um, the way that we're processing grief, so that we can understand how we're able to cope with um, with reminders of lost ones without actually um, having these intrusive thoughts and then having these grief responses.
So when they divided up the group into different reading styles, what they found is that there are parts of the brain which are activated and parts of the brain which are deactivated. So in the amygdala in the center, that's really the part of the brain which is mediating this distress response. And in people who have an intrusive breathing style, that area of the brain really lit up. So that's one part of the amygdala that lit up. And then when they looked at the people who had an avoidant grief style, they found that they were actually, they had a deactivation in that part of the brain. And then they looked at the two other areas, which are regulatory areas, and they saw that there was a kind of an inverse relationship. So it was a little bit more complicated, but what they could see were some areas that control the amygdala are uh, being activated and other areas are being deactivated and that this is different for the two different grieving styles. So the relevance of this was to think about the real difference between what's controlling the amygdala. So just to go back to the, the beginning, remember it's about having um, an attentional bias. If you have an attentional bias to something, then you're more likely to have an intrusive thought and that intrusive thought can trigger a grief emotion. So what's really at the root of that? Well, they were thinking about this from the point of view of functional connectivity. So functional connectivity in the brain is about two areas that have an impact on each other. So if one area uh, has high activity and then the other area has low activity, then that means that maybe that area is regulating the activation of the other. So they wanted to see if the strength of connections between the amygdala and these regulatory areas were having an effect or maybe mediating um, these, the different grief styles. And what they found is after they did the emotional street test, they spent eight minutes with uh, the people who were in the study and they asked them to just go over memories of pleasant memories that they had with their dog that they'd lost. And what they found is that the most predominant emotions were yearning and sadness. So people who had an attentional bias tended to have lower, um, uh, not much of a strong connection between the regulatory regions and the amygdala. And people who were very sad also didn't have a very strong connection between those regions. So this could really be interpreted as people who have uh, easier time being able to control what they pay attention to were actually the people who had strong connections between these regions. So this doesn't mean that there are deficiencies in people who maybe don't have these strong connections, but what it suggests is that this is how the brain is able to control how we sort of continue with our lives with reminders of the people that we love all around us, but without having the grief response. And that kind of gives us an idea of how we progress through grief. So that was really quite uh, an interesting early study. So as I say, the neurobiology of grief is in its infancy. Um, and this is a study that talks about the amygdala, which is implicated in fear responses and has actually been in lots of research to do with anxiety and things like that. So actually since that 2009 paper, more research has been shown to show other areas of the brain that are important that are more to do with actually our reward pathway. So I'm going to talk a bit more about that later. Um, but this is one of the really important studies, I think, that gave us an idea of how we regulate grief. So I think the question of what normal grief is, is actually quite a loaded one, because I think the answer is clearly that having an idea of there being a normal grief really holds people to a standard of what their grief should look like, and I don't think anyone's grief is really the same. But you might be familiar with the Kubler-Ross five stages of grief, which has actually been developed now into nine stages. And these are emotions that people tend to experience when they're grieving, but how much time people spend in each stage and the order and how many times they revisit each stage is really, it really changes between people. So I think that trying to define normal grief in this way is quite problematic and it's quite in, inaccurate really, but uh, it still falls under something that is kind of common and we can explore that. So you never really get over grief, I don't think, and it's like many other life events, you don't get over it, they change you forever, 
and then you incorporate them into a new reality. So one way of defining coping, I guess, with grief and sort of progressing with grief is coming to a point where you're able to incorporate that loss and understand um, the permanence uh, and all the finality of the loss and then be able to continue functioning. And that's really what this separation reaction that I spoke about in the beginning is really about. Because the separation reactions, once you get to a point where you're unable to actually satisfy that yearning, that's when that model begins to change. And that means that your structures that you have in place about yourself and about the life that you're living, that really changes. And grief is, I think, about that progression. And the different ideas about how grief progresses and this linear model at the top actually I don't think is that common. I mean it's 50% of people but to go from having acute stress to low stress is maybe something that you are familiar with the idea of but actually looks a lot more like the bottom. And current research actually shows that there are four trajectories of grief and they look very different but they all still fall under the idea of a normal type of grief. So we have the resilient type of grief, which actually quite, I think, comforting is that a lot of people do have a resilient type of grief where they experience grief, but they're still able to experience positive emotions and able to function. And this is usually around 18 months, but these time frames, I think, they vary. So in the literature, it's 18 months, but they can vary. And um, people that tend to have a resilient type of grief in the studies have shown that they have a low pre-depression score. So people that are not pre already experiencing depression who experience grief uh, and have a resilience uh, course tend to be able to experience positive emotions as well. But for the other three, they're slightly different. So in chronic grief, it lasts longer, maybe four years. And this describes people who have a really reliant relationship on the person that they've lost. So it's quite common amongst um, spouses. And so they find it a little bit more difficult to get past this period of um, rumination and of, of yearning. And then there's the depressed and proof, which is an interesting one because it, it's very confusing, I think, because it is characterized by um, usually relationships that are problematic or in situations where there's um, maybe a terminal illness where you're actually having to witness someone that you love go through a lot of pain, then when that pain is over, then there are obviously mixed emotions about that. And some symptoms can actually improve, some emotional responses can be improved, but there's still grief underlying it. And then there's chronic depressed, which tends to happen in people who are already experiencing depression, and then to go through this loss is something that really then, on top of the fact that they have um, this depression, is much more severe. So as I say, these different progressions, these different symptoms of grief, um, or these different emotions associated with grief are all normal, even though they're extremely painful, they still are normal and our brain is able to find a way to eventually incorporate the loss. But for 7% of people, they actually can all go on to experience something called complex grief. And complex grief is actually characterized by the um, diagnostics, this is the DSM-5, um, which is a way of being able to understand different mood disorders. And what complex grief looks like is really dependent on the severity and the, the length of time. So it can be from months to many, many years. And it's actually more common when it's a spousal loss or it's child bereavement and that's actually 20 to 25% of people. So even though grief is meant to be a normal, um, a normal process, actually, I think it's important to be aware that there is a 7% chance, um, sorry, 7% sorry, of people or one in four chance that it might be more than that. It might actually be a complex grief. 
And complex grief can look like PTSD and it can look like major depressive disorder because a lot of the characteristics are similar, but just to highlight some of the differences. So post-traumatic stress disorder is something that um, happens after some sort of event that is very traumatic and losing a loved one is a very traumatic experience. But the difference between complex grief and post-traumatic stress disorder is that there usually aren't flashbacks and there usually aren't these intrusive, very vivid imagery of the event. But a lot of the other features can be quite similar. And with major depressive disorder, uh, again, it can emotionally feel very similar, but major depressive disorder can be in response to a traumatic event or no event at all. And complex grief is very specific to yearning and loss of someone that you love. And I think this is relevant because once it's diagnosed, it can be better treated. And another thing to consider is the fact that actually with complex grief, you can have an overlap, you can actually have major depressive disorder and you can have complex grief as well. So complex grief isn't just about how you feel, it's not just about how you feel or how you relate to the world on the outside, but there are actually some really important changes that are going on deep within your cells to do with your genes. And the hypothalamic pituitary axis is or the HPA axis is what regulates our stress response. And it's all to do with the secretion of hormones which have an impact on our physiology. So in the brain, in the hypothalamus, we have a hormone called adrenal corticotrophic hormone, corticotrophic hormone which goes to the adrenal, um, which goes to the pituitary gland at the base of the brain and causes the pituitary gland to then release a hormone, which then goes to your adrenal glands on top of the kidney, which releases cortisol, which you may have heard of, or adrenaline. And these are stress hormones, which cause lots of changes in the body. You may have heard of the flight or fight response that's associated with the HPA axis. And these hormones are not inherently bad because they cause changes in our heart rate, for example, that helps us to respond to a stressful environment. But when they are prolonged, it can actually cause changes in the way that our genes are expressed. So in our cells and our chromosomes, we have uh, DNA and we have genes which we're born with and we have inherit from our parents, but the way those genes are expressed can change. So this study in 2014 by Mary Francis O'Connor and her colleagues found that there's a particular gene called type 1 interferon genes and they're associated with the immune system. So the adaptive immune system is what helps us fight infection and these genes are really key and when we have this continuous stressful stimulus as you would from grief which is something that goes on for a while then these hormones are constantly being released and that can actually have an impact on some of those genes and that explains why you might be more susceptible to infection or why you might feel um, tired and can explain a lot of those physiological changes and also explains something called the widower effect which is when a spouse might fall ill after the death of their spouse um, because some of these changes are going on in the body. So this paper is called Craving Love. Um, enduring grief activates the reward centers. And so before when I was talking about the amygdala, um, this is the paper I was really talking about since then. This is in 2014, this is published. And this focused on the reward centers and so the idea that they had when writing this paper was based on the fact that our social bonds are something that are really pleasurable to us. When we're with people that we love, then a part of the brain, and which I'm going to show you in a minute, the nucleus accumbens, is really active. And this is the part of the brain that's involved in the release of dopamine and oxytocin, which is the bonding hormone. So eating chocolate cake, anything pleasurable will have this area being, it's your reward part and it will be really active. It's also the part of the brain that is involved in um, addiction-like um, things, so in response to drugs that activate the reward pathway and, and lead to the release of dopamine. 
it's because of um, this pathway that you have these addiction-like properties. So they were interested in working out whether in people that had complex grief, there might be something going on with the prolonged activation of the reward pathway. So when they are with their loved ones, it, the reward pathway is being activated. When they are bereaved and the loved one is no longer present in, in the world and they and they can't be reunited with them, then they wanted to find out if it was because there was still activation in the reward centers of the brain, which are linked to addiction. And so you can also think of addiction as a craving, and craving is similar to yearning. So this is the reward pathway in the brain, in the center of the brain, and it's the part of the brain that's really active in our relation when we're with people that we love. And then this is the MTO singular cortex, which is associated with physical pain and emotional pain, as I mentioned in the beginning. And what's interesting about this is the metaphor of feeling heartbroken is actually more than just a metaphor. Because it activates the same regions of the brain, it means that those really intense emotions that make you feel like you're in real physical pain, well, your brain actually does think that you are in physical pain because it's the same regions that are being activated. So they expected that the pain regions in the brain would be active in people who were experiencing complex grief, but also people who were going through a more normative um, grief progression. But to find out if also there was activation in the reward pathways, they did a study on a group of women who were average age of 43, who had lost a sister or a mother in the past five years and who were um, bereaved and were still you know, grieving and had been diagnosed with complex grief, and then women who hadn't. And what they did is they used functional magnetic resonance imaging again to work out which parts of the brain were active while they uh, showed the people in the group images of their loved ones. So they would show an image of their loved one, like in a photo album, with words that they had personally used to describe the event of losing their mother or sister. And so when they were in the imaging scanner, they were told that they were able to just feel whatever emotion they felt while they saw these images, and at the same time they were looking at activation in the brain. And what they found is between the two different types of grief between the complex grief and the people who didn't have a diagnosis of complex grief. Actually, yes, the reward center was being activated, whereas in both groups they had activation in the pain center. And when the women were asked sort of about how much they yearned for their mother or sister, it looked like the, um, the degree to which they felt yearning and the activation in the nucleus accumbens, that's the reward center, was correlated. So the more activation in the nucleus accumbens, the more um, yearning they felt. And so the way to interpret this study is really that if the reward center is still being activated and it says it's not that it's pleasurable, obviously grief isn't pleasurable, but when you have these intrusive thoughts, it's harder to resist than really ruminating over those thoughts when those pleasure centers are still being activated. And so if this is the case, this actually is quite useful because then certain treatments such as cognitive behavioral